so hard to see it Took me so long to believe it And you choose someone like me To carry your victory Perfection could never earn it Give what we don't deserve it you take the broken things, raise them to glory. Yes, you are my champion, giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won, I am who you say I am. Confidence, I am seated in the heavenly place, undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. Now I can finally see it. It's teaching me.
every battle you've won. I am. I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated by the power of your name. I'm seated. Hey everybody, welcome to church. My name is Ben. And I'm Michaela. And we wanna let you know about a couple things going on. Yeah, so if this is your first time here at Calgary Life Church, we would love to get you connected in. So if you could fill out one of our connect cards, you can find it in our hallway at our connect center if you're here in person, or you can find it on our app or online. Here at CLC, we believe that generosity is just a part of who we are. When you give, you are impacting lives, not just in our city, our community, but all over the world. So if you're here today, there's a couple different ways that you can give. Yeah, if you would like to give in person, you can come out into the hallway and see our giving station and give there. If you're watching online or you would rather give through online, you can do that through our app or through our website. On April 2nd, we are excited to be having our Good Friday service. We're going to be having two services that day, both in person and online. So make sure you check out the website for more information. And following that Good Friday service, we have our Easter Sunday service. We have our normal service times and it's a great opportunity to invite friends and family along. That's right. And mark off March 26 on your calendar because we are going to be having an in-person youth service that night. We're going to be having games, fun, and a whole lot of laughs. So if you're a teenager, grades 6 to 12, make sure you're there. And another one for the calendar on March the 28th, we will be concluding our 21 days of prayer and fasting with a worship evening. So at 6.30 here at the church, we would love to have you join us for an evening of worship and prayer. On April the 11th, we have our next starting point. So if you're new to Calgary Life Church, or if you would just like to get plugged in, this is a great event for you to attend. You can sign up on our website or through the church app. If you would like to connect with us after the service, you can join us by jumping into one of our Zoom lobbies. You can find the link on our website or in the chat. We hope to see you there. To stay up to date with anything else going on in the church, make sure that you follow us on social media and download that CLC app. And that's it for Church News. Hey, good morning, Calgary Life Church. So glad that uh, you're all tuning in today. Uh, got a special treat for you and uh, our very own Ben Newfelt is gonna share the Word of God. Now, Ben, you know, he uh, came to the church, you know, with his family when he was just, uh, you know, a young lad, and we've watched this young man just grow into his calling. He speaks with passion. He's got a fresh word. Him and his wife, Laura, do a tremendous job in not only leading our kids' ministry, but also CLC youth. Uh, I've heard from many in our church that he's definitely one of their favorite speakers. So, hey, get ready and let's uh, hear a fresh word from our very own Ben Newfeld. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in with us today. Um, as Pastor Anthony already mentioned a moment ago, my name is Ben and uh, I have what I believe to be is the best job here working at CLC, getting to lead our kids and youth program along with my wife, Laura. And uh, if you've been tracking with that kids program over this past year, you may know me as a couple different aliases. Uh, you may know me as Parker Freerunner, uh, John Karate, Ranger Scott. Everybody loves Ranger Scott. But unfortunately, today you just get Ben. So uh, maybe in a future message you'll get Ranger Scott, but we'll see. You never know what happens. Uh, anyways, today what I want to talk about is carry on this series that our pastor has been preaching for the last few weeks called The Great Reset. And uh, in this series, he's been talking about resetting our faith, resetting our mindset, resetting our prayer life. And I want to carry that on today and talk to you about resetting our confidence. And uh, so first things first, let me uh, read a piece of scripture for you. This is Philippians 
chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. It says this, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. From the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. So, uh, before we get too much into that, I wanted to share something with you guys real quick. And uh, the other day, I saw something very exciting. I had to tell you about it. Is I got up, I looked out the window, and uh, just having a little cup of coffee, and I saw this guy walking his dog. Now, I don't normally just get excited when I see people walking down the street. Um, don't, well actually I do get excited usually when I see a dog, but I got excited because of what this man was wearing. I looked out my window and this guy was in shorts and a t-shirt. And I felt like this was our sign from God that spring is officially upon us. I had to go outside and feel it for myself. It's weird to think that like two weeks ago it was minus 40 and, uh, and now we're looking at double digits. But with this warm weather, I've been finding myself getting really excited about summer. I love summer. I don't know about you. It's my favorite time of year. I love summer activities. I love, I love camping. I love, I love hiking and campfires and playing games outside and, and these sorts of things. And I've been finding that as I've been, I've been thinking about summer, um, I've been feeling really nostalgic about one thing in particular. You see, there is, there's one summer activity that in my very, very biased opinion is the ultimate summer activity, and that is summer camp. I love summer camp. Uh, it is the highlight of my year. I feel like my year is summer camp and Christmas and everything else are just a countdown to those two events in the year. And so uh, lately I've been finding myself going back and looking at old camp photos and reading old camp journals and, and I've just been feeling really nostalgic thinking about all these camp memories that we've made over the years. And you know, things like having campfires with our youth and playing games with them and, and, and honestly just seeing our young people fall in love with Jesus. Uh, but you know, 99% of these memories are awesome. But there's this one camp memory that has been haunting me this week. There's this one camp memory that I have just been struggling to, to, to deal with. It's one of those memories, you ever have a memory you just wish that you could forget? You could do the whole Dumbledore thing where he pulls it out of his head and just put it in a jar somewhere. This happened a couple of years ago. And uh, we were playing this game at camp called Sticks. And it's basically like four corner capture the flag. So each team has their own quadrant and I can take people who come into my quadrant and you can take people who come into your quadrant. Now, it's a fun game, it's a simple game. It's not an overly physical game. I mean, it's physical in the sense that you're doing a lot of running, but it's not physical in the sense that it's a full contact game. But as most of you parents probably know, is that when it comes to teenage boys, it doesn't matter what game you're playing, it's a full contact game. And uh, you give a group of 12 year olds a soccer ball and you're gonna come up with a wrestling match. You put a frisbee in their hands and you're walking away with stitches. And, and it's no different with the game of sticks. And so every time we play this game sticks, it starts off pretty calm, starts off pretty tame, but then without fail, you have these ego matches pop up. And, and, and two guys will line up on either side of their line, each side of the divider, and, and they'll lock eyes. And it's almost like when two bucks bash into each other. And, and they lock arms and, and, and just start pulling as hard as they can, trying to, uh, trying to do one of two things. Is A, pull that boy off to the other side, and B, impress all the girls around them. Uh, and so, without fail, these little ego matches always pop up in the game of sticks and, and a couple years ago we were playing it and there was this one youth who just kept talking. Just talking and talking and talking and, 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 and it was just getting to me. This entire game, he was just sharking me. Being like, come on Ben, come on Ben. Are you afraid of me Ben? Come on, what are you scared of? 
What are you scared of, Ben? And he's just going on and on. It's driving me crazy. And I believe that in youth ministry, that there are times where you just need to be the adult, where you need to calm your mind, control your tongue, just get your emotions in check. And then there are other times where you need to assert your dominance and you need to remind these teenage boys who the top dog in town is. And so I decide that this is one of those moments where I don't need to, to, to turn the other cheek. This is one of those moments where I need to let them know who the alpha in the pack is. And so enough is enough and I lock up with this guy. And we count down three, two, one. We clasp hands and we pull as hard as we can. And to my surprise, so the next thing I know is I open up my eyes and I'm lying there face down in the dirt with the smuggest looking teenage boy standing over top of me. You see, church, there are certain things in our lives that we learn to rely on. That when I went to bed last night, I went to bed with the confidence that the sun was going to rise this morning. That when I sat down on this stool that I'm sitting on right now, I sat down with the confidence that it would bear my weight. And when I challenge a 16-year-old boy to a contest of strength, that is a competition that I have confidence that I expect to win. But how many of you know that sometimes things happen in our lives? That a loved one gets sick, we lose our job, that we end up in a worldwide pandemic, that we get out-muscled by a 16-year-old boy and our confidence is shaken. I don't know if you've ever felt like your confidence has been shaken before. The next thing that you know is you're lying there in the dirt and it's not just one teenage boy, but now you have a whole gaggle, a whole flock of teenage boys who all saw what happened and now they all want a piece of you and they all want to try. And they all want to test your strength. And where once you were so confident in your abilities, you were so confident in your capacity, but now you're lying there and you're second guessing yourself and asking these questions. Do I still have it? Did I lose it? Have I lost my edge? If that's you today, church, then I hope that this is going to encourage you. Is that because while our confidence may be shaken, it doesn't have to stay that way. There is, uh, in, in, in the context of confidence, there's one character in the Bible who's always kind of stood out to me. Uh, and it's this guy named Peter. You've probably heard of Peter. He's one of the disciples, pretty popular character in the Bible. Uh, if you've been around church, you've probably heard that name. Um, but, but Peter is a great example of confidence because he had moments where he had a lot of confidence and he had moments where he didn't really have much confidence at all. And uh, he had his fair share of confidence issues. And not only did Peter have confidence issues, he also had friends to write down those issues for him. So it's like having those friends. Do you have those friends who when you get hurt, instead of helping you, they just take photos of you? Um, that was Peter's friends. And so we find it actually in all of the Gospels. But I want to read this account to you from the book of Luke, uh, chapter 22, verse 54 to 62. It says this. This is following right after Jesus has been betrayed by his disciple Judas and he's been led away as a captive to the religious leaders of the day to be put on trial. And it says that then they seized him, being Jesus, and they led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down to, together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man, he was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I don't know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, Hey, you're, you're, you're also one of them. But Peter said again, Man, I'm not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him. For he's a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know him. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord. 
how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. Then Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now, when I read that passage, I find myself asking the question of how did Peter find himself in this position? You see, in in the grand scheme of the gospel, it feels very out of character for Peter to be acting the way he is. In the context of confidence, there is one disciple who time and time again stood head and shoulders above the others, and that was Peter. You know, Peter takes a lot of criticism for things like, like doubting Jesus and falling in the water during the storm, but what other disciple had the confidence to get out of the boat in the first place? That time and time again, you see this theme of when Jesus asks a question, Peter is the first one to put his hand up, even if he doesn't have the right answer. He is confident. I mean, for context, moments before this passage takes place, Jesus is in the garden with his disciples. When these guards show up, led by Judas Iscariot, and they come to put handcuffs on Jesus, and what does Peter do? You know, if you just read that passage alone, you'd probably be like, well, he probably ran away. He probably got really scared. He probably freaked out. He probably just tucked tail and ran. But that's not what happened. Is that in this moment, Peter stands between Jesus and these guards. He pulls out his sword and he faces them and says, if you're going to get to him, you've got to go through me. That in the garden, Peter is willing to lay his life down for Jesus. He's swinging his sword. He's chopping off ears. And and Jesus tells him, Peter, lay down your sword. And something changes. What happened to Peter? Why is it that on one hand we have Peter, the water-walking, ear-chopping son of a gun, and on the other hand, we have Peter, the guy who's pretending that he doesn't know Jesus. The guy who is denying Jesus to a little girl. What happened in between that caused Peter to lose his confidence? See, I believe that it comes down to this. That when it comes to confidence, it matters a whole lot more where you put it than what happens to it. It matters a whole lot more about the placement of your confidence than what's going on to your confidence. See, where was Peter's confidence? Where had he put his confidence? Check this out. In the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 to 23, it says this. Uh, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes. He told them that he was going to be killed, and on the third day he'd be raised. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Okay, first things first, that if you needed any more proof that Peter has confidence, look no further than that. Okay, there, there are moments in my life when I'm at McDonald's, and, and, and they forget the, the dipping sauce for my chicken nuggets. And, and I have to sit there and hype myself up in order to go to the counter and tell them that they got my order wrong. Okay, now Peter is not confronting a fast food cashier. He is confronting Jesus Christ. It takes some confidence to do something like that. Peter has confidence. There's no doubt about it. There's no question about it. He's a very confident person. But listen to what it says next. He says to Jesus, far be it from you, Lord. This isn't going to happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Why is it that in one moment, Peter can stand down armed guards and in the next moment deny Jesus to a little girl. It's because he set his mind on the things of man, not on the things of God. Peter had confidence, and he had a whole lot of it, but his confidence was in his own plans, not God's plans. His, His confidence was in the things that he had in his own hand, that he could control, not in the things that 
God had in his hands. And so when Peter had to lay down his sword, he had to lay down his confidence with it. Check this out. Your confidence will only last as long as what you have in it. Your confidence will only ever be secure as in the thing that it's placed in. It's kind of like this. Let me explain. I have here a jug of water, okay? Now, pretend with me for a moment that this jug of water is your confidence. Now, we have two vessels, two options here, is we have a cup and we have a bottle. Now, let's consider that this is the things of man, and this is the things of God. Now, we have an option of what we're going to do with our confidence. First off, we could put it in the things of man. What are the things of man? I think that the confidences of man are a lot of the things that we're used to talking about. That if I was to say to you, hey man, just be confident. If, if someone is like, Ben, should I ask that girl out? How should I do it? And I say, man, just be confident. These are the things that we're usually talking about. And what are these? These are being confident in our body. It's being confident in the way that we look. It's being happy with our self-image. These are being confident in our money, right? That, that, that basing our confidence in, in how much we've got in our bank account, in how well our investments are doing, in how well our stocks are trending. It's, it's having confidence in our talents, that the things that we're really good at are gonna open doors for us, that the things that we're really good at are gonna give us opportunities and career advancements. These are the things of men. Now, over here we have the things of God. Now, what are the things of God? It could be all sorts of stuff. That the things of God is, is His plan. It's His purpose. It's His sufficiency. It's His care. It's His love. And when things are going well, it can be really hard to differentiate one confidence from the other. It is that on both hands, both of these vessels are doing their job quite well. And when things are going well, things are sailing, things are smooth, each vessel is really holding my confidence quite well. But every once in a while, something happens. You know, I'm not saying don't be confident in your body. I absolutely believe that we should be confident in our body, you know. I, I, I try to work out and the reality is, is that I don't exercise because it's healthy. I exercise because I want to look good. <laughs> is that fair to say? We should be confident in the way that we look, but, but what about when our body breaks? What about when we get sick? Or, or we get older and we get injured? What happens is our confidence is shaken. What about if our confidence is in our money and all of a sudden things were looking good but now our Dogecoin is dropping and, 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 and our investments aren't looking as well and, and we're seeing more red than green and our confidence is shaken. That what about if, if, if all of our confidence is in our talents, in our abilities, in our um, capacity to just work things out through, through sheer skill alone? And then somebody more talented shows up on the scene. What happens is our confidence is shaken. And the next thing that we know, our cup is dry. Why is it that on one hand, our confidence remains secure? And on the other hand, our confidence runs out. It's not because of what happened to our confidence. Both, both vessels experienced the same thing, but on one hand, our confidence collapsed, and on the other hand, our confidence remains secure, not because of what happened to it, but because of where we put it. You see, when we put our confidence in the world, at some point in time, the world is going to let us down, but there is one who will not be shaken. And church, if there's one thing that I want you to know, if there's one thing that I want you to lean on, it's this. It's to put your confidence in Christ because he isn't going to let you down. Check this out. Psalm 62, verse 5 and 6, it says this. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. I will not be shaken. Church, I want you to know today 
that when, when, when you put your confidence in Christ, that you can face down oceans and you can face down giants and you will remain because my confidence is secure. It, it, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know if you've watched Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, and, and there's that scene where they're in that underwater submarine and they're going to where Jar Jar Binks' place is and, and they're being chased by the giant fish and it's almost got them when all of a sudden a bigger fish comes and swallows that fish. And Qui-Gon Jinn, he, he turns around and he's like, there's always a bigger fish. Who are you putting your confidence in? The reality is, I'm a small fish. Okay, <laughs> that in the grand scheme of the world, I am a small fish. And at some point in time, my confidence is going to be shaken. That if my confidence is just in myself, that confidence will run dry. Why not put your confidence in the biggest fish? Why not put your confidence in the greatest fish? That's a confidence that will not run dry. Now, this sounds really nice, right? <laughs> but how do we actually do it? Is that, yes, that's encouraging and, and, and exciting, but how do we actually place our confidence? You know, when we say to someone, man, just be confident, how do you be confident? If you tell me, Ben, jump, I can jump. If you tell me, run, I can run. If you tell me, spin, I can spin. But how do I be confident? I think that if COVID has revealed anything to us, it's that anything that can be shaken has been shaken. And like Peter, I believe that there are many of us who are coming out of this season and it feels like our confidence has been shaken. You know, we're wondering that I've spent so much time alone, I've spent so much time at home, I haven't been to church in a year. If I go, are people still gonna remember me? Have they forgotten about me? What if they don't even know my name anymore? Our confidence is shaken. I think a lot of us have kind of been consoling ourselves with this thought that, well, when COVID is over, things are going to go back to normal, right? That you, man, you just wait. When, when, when COVID is over, things are going to be better than they ever have been before. When COVID is over, business is going to be booming. When COVID is over, people are going to be partying. When COVID is over, things are going to be better than they ever have been before. But you know what? That phrase is starting to sound a lot like SpongeBob to me. What do I mean by that? There's this character in SpongeBob. His name is Plankton. And if you've ever watched SpongeBob and his whole, his whole thing, his whole shtick is, is, is getting the, the Krabby Patty formula. Every episode, it's just like, man, if I just get that Krabby Patty formula, business is going to boom. If I just get that Krabby Patty formula, things are going to be great. If I just get that Krabby Patty formula, if I just get it, if I just get it, if I just get it, if COVID just ends. But the, the running gag in SpongeBob is that he never gets it. That he never quite gets his hands on the thing that he's looking for. And, and, and in a similar way, we're kind of expecting that when COVID ends, that things are just going to go back to normal and we're just going to be the same again. And you know, I believe that, that in, in, in a soon amount of time that, yeah, things are going to start looking pretty normal again. But does that mean that you're going to be the same? That what's been shaken has been shaken. And sometimes it feels like, well, well, the shaking happened and, and, and now it's stopped, but, but my cup is still empty. How can I be confident if I have no more water to give? I want to give you an encouragement today, church. Philippians 3, 6. I will be confident in this. That he who began a good work will be faithful to carry it to completion that what you think you've lost, that the confidence that you think you've lost, God is working right now to restore. Check this out. The next time that we find Peter, after all of this has gone down, a lot happens. <laughs> a lot goes on in between that moment of Peter's denial and the next time that we see him is, is Jesus is put on trial. He's accused by the Pharisees. He's led to a cross. And there he's put to death. They take his body and they put it in a tomb. And three days pass, the disciples are scattered, they're scared, they don't know what to do. 
The three days pass and Jesus rises again. And he emerges from that empty tomb with the keys of death, hell, and the grave in his hands. And things are better than they have ever been before. Things are greater than they ever have been before. The devil has been defeated and Jesus is standing victorious. And yet despite the greatness of the things going on around him, Peter is still shaken. He's got the Krabby Patty formula, but it hasn't fixed his problems. The season of COVID is over, but he's been changed by his trauma. See, the next time that we find Peter, we find him on a boat. We find him fishing. And what's significant about that? What's the big deal with, with Peter fishing? Maybe he just enjoys it. Maybe he was just having a meal, sure. But, but what, what I believe is going on here is that Peter's actions of fishing hint towards something going on within him. That, that they point towards a greater thing going on inside of Peter. And, and, and it's this is that a lot actually hasn't changed for Peter. It, it shows the position of his confidence. See, here's the thing, is that it is always easiest. It's always easiest to go back to the things that we know. That when push comes to shove, old habits die hard. And, and we find ourselves in this struggle between who I used to be and who God is calling me to be. And so things have gone wrong and now they're better, but Peter has returned to what he knows. He's put his confidence in what he can put his hands to. When they're on the boat and Jesus calls out to them, and Peter recognizes that it's Jesus' voice, and he jumps off the boat and he swims to shore, and they make this meal together. And while they're sitting down having breakfast, Jesus says this in uh, the book of John, chapter 21. Then they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, He says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Then feed my lambs. Then he said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him again, then tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said it to him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all these things, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, then feed my sheep. Why is Jesus asking this question? Does he need an answer? See, here's the thing about Jesus, is that he doesn't really ask questions that he doesn't already know the answer to. You see, the big deal with Jesus is that he's God, <laughs> and, and God knows stuff. Is Jesus asking Peter, do you love me? Because he needs to hear him say it? Is, is he asking Peter this because he doesn't know the answer? See, I believe that it's a lot more likely that Jesus is asking this question not for his own sake, but for Peter's sake. See, here's the thing is that we get so caught up in our plans. We get so caught up in our ideas. We get so caught up in the things of man. We get caught up in our five-year plans, our investment opportunities, our next step in life, that we lose sight at times of the thing that is more important than anything else. Peter. Do you love me? See, I believe that what Jesus was doing with that question is he was refixing Peter's focus on the thing that's most important. When it feels like you've lost your confidence, what is it that we need to do to get it back? Do we need to work harder? Do we need to plan more? Do we need to become more structured? Or do we need to learn how to live in love? You know, I have a dog, his name is Carl, he's my pal. He's a pretty cool dog, I like him a lot. And we spend a lot of time together. And there's this thing about Carl that I love, is that he, he can tell the difference in my pants, okay? He's, he's a smart dog, 
And, and when I go to my closet and I put on a, a pair of pants, he knows what are home pants and what are going out pants. And, and when I put on my going out pants, there's always this moment of uncertainty for Carl where he smells it and he's not sure. He's like, am I coming with or am I staying behind? And the minute that I pick up his leash, he knows oh, I'm coming along for the trip. And he gets so excited, his tail starts wagging, he can barely contain himself. He's so excited. And here's the thing about Carl, is that he's so excited, but he doesn't even know where he's going. Is that he has no idea. We could be going to the park, we could be going to the vet, we could be going to my mom and dad's house, we could be going to here in the church, we could be going to any one place. We could be going out to play some fetch, or maybe we're going out just to run some errands. But to Carl, it doesn't matter. You see, he's excited, he's exhilarated. Why? Because he cares more about the company than he does about the destination. What does it take to get back our confidence? What does it take to refuel our confidence? Is learning how to live, loving the company more than the destination. That when I'm an old man, and I look back at my life, what do I want to see? Do I want to see a life of achievements? Or do I want to see a life that has been lived passionately in love with Jesus? See, I believe that when we live from that position of love, it doesn't matter what's going on around us. It doesn't matter what 16-year-old boys are out muscling us. It doesn't matter how long COVID lasts. It doesn't matter what's going on with the economy because our confidence is assured. We cast our cares on him because he cares for us. And so church, today, if you're struggling with your confidence, if you're feeling like it's lost, if you feel like you've lost your edge, your passion, I want to encourage you with this. Sometimes the trick is not to do more, it's actually to do less. It's learning how to sit back and put away the fishing rod, have a meal with Jesus, and remind yourself of his love. And if you're here today, and that love is totally new to you, maybe it's your first time tuning in, and you're thinking to yourself, man, I've been putting a lot of confidence in myself, and this season has left me feeling shaken. Well, I want you to know that there is not a checklist that you need to complete in order to earn God's favor. There is not a list of to-dos that you need to work your way through before you're accepted into his family. It's as simple as believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth. As many as do so are saved. So if you're here today and you wanna make that decision to live a life in love with Jesus, then I just wanna pray for you. So Father, thank you so much for everybody tuning in right now, whatever city, whatever country that they're in. God, I thank you that you see them where they're at, in their living room, in their bedroom, and wherever they are right now. And God, we just make a decision right here to lean into your love. God, we acknowledge that our plans and our procedures can't put us back together. And so today we take our confidence and we put it in you. And we thank you, Father, that you care for us that you are the rock that will not be shaken, that you will not let us down. Father, today we choose to follow you. Amen. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you next week. If you made the decision today to follow Jesus, we want to celebrate with you. So the next thing that we want you to do is jump onto the CLC website or CLC app and fill out a Connect card. You'll see a little box on there that says, I've decided to follow Jesus. Check that off and one of us will reach out to you and help walk you through these next steps. We'd also like to send you one of these red bags right here. It's just got a couple different resources to help you out as you begin this walk with God, including a New Testament Bible, a little book called Why Jesus, and some teachings from Pastor Anthony. So make sure you do that. And again, we're so happy for you.